Now, when discussing the logos or the logic of a particular speech, its arguments or the structures inside of it, we can tend to look at things either inductively or deductively. I'd like to first talk about what we call deductive argumentation. Now, this goes all the way back to the days of Plato and Aristotle, and I'd like to introduce you folks to the very first form of deductive reasoning, or what's referred to as the syllogism. Now, for some of you folks who may have taken an advanced philosophy class or a class in logic or even maybe advanced math, and you're probably a little scared of truth tables, modus podens and modus tollens, but I'd like to just introduce you to the basic structure right now. First, we have what's known as the deductive syllogism. Now, the deductive syllogism has three major parts to it. We have what we call the major premise, we have the minor premise, and then we have a conclusion that comes from it. Now, inside of the deductive syllogism, let's say we take the major premise that all women are mortal, right? And then we could say that Socrates is a man or woman. Uh, and then finally, we would come to some sort of solution that Socrates, of course, is mortal. Now, from these presuppositions, we can internally create a logic structure that puts them all together. So if we were to say that this phrase, woman or men, is A, and then we say are mortal, so therefore B, then we take a minor premise, which is a subset of that original claim, saying Socrates, a singular person inside of that subset, is a man, so A equals B, and now C equals A, Therefore, remember these three dots? Any of you folks ever seen these before? <laughs> Socrates is in fact mortal, or if we were to put it out mathematically, C is in fact equal to B. Now, of course, laying out the entire syllogism oftentimes is pretty boring. Even Aristotle talks about it. He says usually what we do is we tend to put referential objects inside of the syllogism so that one of these areas can just be replaced. So for example, he says, that when Dorius has won the contest with a crown, it is enough to have said he has won the Olympic Games. And there is no need to add that the Olympic Games have a crown as the prize, for everybody knows that. So I guess in contemporary sort of circles, you'd be able to say, hey, if I showed off my gold medal from the Olympics, you would automatically already assume that I won the gold medal in the Olympics because it would say medal with Olympics on it. So you wouldn't have to have the major premise of Olympic Games give out medals. It would just be simply Cossum has a medal, therefore Cossum won the games. Now, in addition to this, we do see what we call enthymematic reasoning. So when we take out one of these presuppositions or replace it with something else or let the audience figure it out themselves, oftentimes we have what Aristotle would refer to as an enthymeme. So we have scenarios in which we would take a proposition out. So if we were just to say, Socrates has died, then you would already get to the conclusion that Socrates was in fact mortal, because the presupposition is, is that he was a person that had some sort of mortality to him. Now, cleverly enough, a lot of different areas have used this. So back in the 1990s, when I was your age, there was a set of commercials that were put out by the milk industry, and they used to always say, great cheese comes from happy cows. So cheese and happy cows, and that great cows come from California, so therefore cows and California, and then they would always end off by saying, California, it's the cheese. And it's pretty funny because you would kind of almost participate in your own persuasion, even though you've probably never seen a happy cow, and you're not really sure if you've seen too many in California. I don't know about you folks, but anytime I drive up the five freeway, I see a lot of unhappy cows. Another example that comes from contemporary sort of uh, literature or commercials that you folks hear, uh, maybe you've heard the phrase, with a name like Smuckers, it has to be good, right? So this notion that a name of a company called Smuckers, and the term Smuckers implies a delicious lip-smacking situation, you therefore, you put yourself in a scenario where you say, ah, Smuckers. Therefore, it must be good. These would be examples of using the logical form of a deductive syllogism almost enthymematically, taking a part of it out and allowing the audience to be participatory in their own persuasion.